pleasure to have you all here this afternoon on the second day of the IPAC uh, to discuss the significance of popularizing architecture. So architects and architecture, I mean architecture is often called to be very elitist and rightly so. We have not felt the need to reach out to people. It is in the grain of architecture that has always been rooted in bureaucratic, royal or corporate patronage. So here today we are here to discuss what could be the methods to communicate with the public at large, why popularize, how to popularize, who to reach, and who to include in this dialogue. So with this, I'm going to give it to Sanchit to, uh, to uh, introduce our uh, panelists. Sanchit, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. It gives me great honor to introduce you a panel for today's discussion. We have Sir Roger, Con Ro Roger Connor from Ruthin. Sir Roger Connor is an associate professor at Azraeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, visiting professor at the School of Art and Design, Gaon Gaon University of Technology, and is the international chair at Sashan School of Art and Architecture, Gurgaon. He has carried out exemplary publications, exhibitions, and film over four decades in Finland, Sweden, India, Pakistan, Italy, USA, UK, and Canada. In India, Professor Connor has taught film and media at Jamia Mila Islamia, design at NID Ahmedabad, exhibition design at Pragati Medan, and has been an art creative for Times of India as well. So Connor has also designed and curated exhibitions such as Calm, Shelter, Satish Gujra Retrospective, and Nexus NID Ahmedabad 1987. He has worked in many films such as Drive, 27, Min 27 Minute Lies, Take 5, Involuntary Architecture, and Six City. Some of his publications are being an architect with Ian Ritchie, writing architecture from MIT 1989, Welcome to the Hotel Architecture, MIT 1999, and How Architecture Got Its Hump from MIT in 2001. He also runs an alternative architectural practice here on Mazi Studio with John Marusak. It's a privilege to have you on board with us, sir. Here we go. What am I supposed to do? Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh my gosh. We are also being joined by Sir Sanjoy K. Roy. <laughs> All right. Sanjoy, sir, is managing director at Teamwork Arts, an exceptionally versatile production company which produces a large number of highly acclaimed performing arts, visual arts, and literary festivals across many cities and countries such as Australia, Canada, Egypt, France. Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Israel, Korea, Singapore, South Africa, Spain, UK, and the USA, and includes the world's largest literary gathering, the annual Jaipur Literature Festival. For over 25 years, Teamwork Art has been, has been taking India to the world and brought to the world to India, presenting the finest of Indian performers, writers, and visual artists in the cultural and art space in India and abroad. Sir Sanjoy is also a founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, working to provide support services for street and working children in the inner city of Delhi, where over 55,000 children are benefited from education, training, and residential okay, services over the past years. The White House recently presented him the US President's Com Committee of Arts and Humanities Award for International Organization. He is an advisor for the arts and diversity for numerous government and non-governmental organizations across the world. The arts of India are unrivaled in their depth, diversity, and mystery, and showcasing it to the global audience requires a deep understanding of our culture, an acute sense of relevance in programming, and an unflinching attention to detail. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, sir. Oh my gosh, another scarf. Oh my gosh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We also have Dr. Vibhuti Sachdev, de Dean of Sashant School of Art and Architecture, joining us for the discussion. 
Dr. Sachdev qualified as an architect from the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi in 1989. After a period spent in practice and research in India, she undertook a PhD in Architectural Theory at School of Oriental and African Studies. Dr. Sachdev is an authority of Vastu Vidya. Many of her publications concern this or related knowledge systems and their expression in architecture and art. I shall now leave Professor Roger Kona to go ahead with the presentation on the public understanding of architecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, can you check the uh, mic, please? Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And we'll have to go a little, uh, a little quick today because our guest has to leave at 3 o'clock. So, so I'm, um, I'm very happy to be Lord Roger. Uh, and I'm, so, I'm sure Sanjoy is Sir Sanjoy. So the fact that Sushant has knighted and uh, Dr. Sachdev is Sir Dr. Sachdev. So we'll enjoy this. Now, uh, the public understanding of architecture. You'll see a man there pointing at you. The men generally explain, and the women generally listen. Wrong. We have to stop that. I'm going to discuss a little bit what the public understanding of architecture could entail. Anybody, who knows Richard Dawkins? Anybody? Hands up if you know Richard Dawkins. Only your dean and one other. Okay. Well, maybe you should know a little bit about Richard Dawkins, who wrote The Selfish Meme. Uh, and the whole aspect of the meme, and you all know what memes are, because you invent them on, on, on your iPhone. A viral meme. Why is a meme viral? What is a meme? A meme is an institute, it's an item of culture that is replicated. Much like genetics. Anyway, this, the significance here is that Richard Dawkins was the first professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford. Think about it. A professor in the public understanding of science. Uh, you, can, you can follow this up. Uh, it was a five-year appointment. Someone else has taken it over. For about 10 years, I have been recommending to different people around the world that we need a chair or an institute about the public understanding of architecture. So what is it, and why is it important? Architecture is shown through many things. The architect explains, the journals analyze, the academics research, the critics analyze. Again, the architect writes, the architects write poems, the journalist carnivalizes architecture, the engineer rhapsodizes architecture, the novelist expounds, the essayist explores, and the newspapers promote. How do the public experience architecture out of these? This is a crucial issue and one I would like to discuss with Sanjoy today. This is not the public's understanding of architects' architecture. Many people think that the public don't understand what you or we do. Maybe they don't, and maybe we can communicate a little better. But the question is, all each of us have a public understanding of architecture, whether we are educated in architecture or not. So this is the first thing to consider, that the public have a right to their own perception about space, volume. They don't use the word space. The public don't use the word volume. The public don't use the word morphology. The public don't understand mapping. So how are we going to communicate? We're not just going to say, oh, you need to learn mapping. You need to learn our vocabulary. No. I think we need to start thinking of new vocabularies and where these will come from. I put in there the architecture of a woman. I will talk about that later. So it's the public's perception of architecture that we're going to try and explore. So usually the architect explains. This is Ricardo Bofill, uh, flamboyant, 
a Spanish architect who was well known in the 1980s uh, into the 1990s when postmodernism and classicism started to be reused in the vocabulary of architecture. This is a man, Clough Williams Ellis, an excellent autobiography if anybody wants to look at it, the architect errant. But that's explaining to people who already know about architecture. To read these books, you'd probably have to have some knowledge of architecture. The journals analyze. We produce journals. Generally, our journals are academic journals. This is to be released on Friday in this school, your first journal of architecture. But not every essay or piece in this journal is elite. Our essays can be written in different ways. So it's how you write. But generally, architectural journals are usually used for a certain um, demographic. And we might say, I wouldn't say it's elite, it's just an informed demographic, those who know. So it's using a vocabulary that you already kind of know and learn. You will look at these yourselves. The academics research, which I call the unreadable. It's not necessarily unreadable. But these two books, this one is my own, which is a big, huge, fairly unreadable volume, but actually has quite a lot of treasures inside if you spend the time reading it. But it demands a different reading. On the right is a book which is all poetic, cosmic poetics of the forest and the journey. These books were, were published by MIT Press at exactly the same time, 1989. They indicated a type of writing that was coming into architecture that was a little bit different. Critics analyze. All these are critics who are not necessarily architects, all extremely good books, but not for the public. Uh, well-known people, which you probably wouldn't know, and certainly the public would not know. But very attractive, very good essays, well-written, but still in a language that can defeat our interest. Someone like Gautam Bhatia, who is an architect uh, from Delhi, who, this is the, the type of book written in a more popular He's not setting out to popularize architecture, but he's actually writing in a much more accessible way. The idea of popularity and accessibility is important. Um, he's got a lot to say that's technical that you would understand. But somebody outside architecture who had an interest in Laurie Baker and the development of architecture from where he came from, his life, work, and writings, would enjoy this. But again, it's not for all the public. Why should it be? That we should ask that question. But the same writer writes provocatively. You can find these in the library. They may be out of print, but they're very enjoyable. First of all, they appeared in newspaper, as newspaper articles, which is one way something becomes popular. They're written in a style which is uh, ironic. They make fun of Greater Kailash Baroque. The idea of Baroque in Greater Kailash is a bit of a stretch. But you need to know that. You need to know why that is an argument. I recommend both of, you, uh, both of these books to be, you can have a look at. But then the architects write poems. This is one of mine. This is one by John Haydock. John, they're both published exactly the, I think, the same year, 1998. Unusual that architects are asked to write poems, or it's an experiment. It worked, it sold, but it's a different way of, if I use the word popularizing architecture, it's a different way of talking about architecture. 
And poetry, poetics, is something that I think you also, some of you, can, can take on if you're interested. It's how you do these things. Then there's the journalist. We've got a lot of, we've got a lot of books like this. Uh, you could familiarize yourselves and maybe we can, we can prepare a catalog on these. Um, this is Tom Wolfe from uh, New York, writes very entertainingly. This could be read by any informed reader. You don't have to be an architect. Uh, you don't have to be a writer. You don't have to be an engineer. This is just interesting. And he, he re, you can see, the, the, of course, the, the, the irony in the title, from Bauhaus to our house. Bauhaus being the German movement that actually sort of embedded modernism under Walter Gropius in the 1920s, um, and then uh, became the Bauhaus, which then spread to America, with Gropius leaving to um, Boston, Mies van der Rohe leaving to Chicago, and they set up the American version of the Bauhaus, which became American modernism in these two schools. Very important. This is a very interesting read of that. And it makes fun. It is humorous. Humor is important. Why can't we make fun of our own profession? We should be able to do this. Probably the best book written on architecture, I would say, for a general public and also an informed pub public, is written by an engineer, Peter Rice. He's the man who actually made Sydney Opera House, he, he started his work in the Sydney Opera House and then went on to Beaubourg, Santo Beaubourg in the middle of Paris, 1976. But Peter Rice writes interestingly about how a love of horse racing, poetry, wild flowers and structures makes him an engineer. Very important that we have those sort of narratives. They're not just singular. But novelists, probably, I don't know anyone in this audience that has read a book by William Gibson. You're all ap a absolutely wrapped in William Gibson's world at the moment, because all cyber world and vi virtual world comes out of the work of Neuromancer. Neuromancer is a novel from 1989 which predicated a lot of this work that's going on in virtual reality, in cybercrime, in um, gaming, uh, around the time of Blade Runner, which was the film that actually became so important to architects. So this did popularize a form of space, a form of city, and the way you're looking. So you've got here China Miavel, who is a British writer who writes The City and the City. You can go on to BBC and see the film of that. This is actually popularizing all sorts of worlds which we design, you design, you are part of. Then you've got J.G. Ballard, who is an older British writer who wrote High Rise in the 1970s where the, the, the drama of a high-rise became absolutely pathological till everyone started killing themselves. And it's a, it's a film out two years ago. That's J so all these are a way of talking about architecture, the city, but they're not using the vocabulary that we use, they're not using the terms of space or section or elevation, but they are popularizing, they're talking about different environments. Then you've got the essayists, the people who write essays. Uh, this is an Indian collection, small essays about different cities that tell us a lot about the cities that you come from. Very important. We have lots of, uh, and I wouldn't say popular essays, but it actually spreads, popularize if you like, to use the word, it spreads the notion of architecture and space design. Then you've got essays like this, Sexuality and Space, edited by Beatrice Colomina. 
These are more academic exercises, but I in a book like this, you'll find a much more, uh, some essays will be much more approachable, uh, written by different people who are not architects. Newspapers promote, some of them more intelligently than others. Um, given that we have Hafiz Contractor on Saturday, <coughs> I found this newspaper in my archive from 1987. Newspapers spread out the architectural ideas in a different way. You can see how important interiors are, and I'm sorry about the quality, uh, uh, it did get flooded, so it was uh, retrieved from a flood. But have you ever looked at the language of newspapers, how they speak about architecture? Let's read this. Like lifestyle, clothes and ornaments, a building today is interesting only if it is more than itself, if it changes the space around it. Everyone can read that. Whether it's true or not depends on who's reading and how they feel. Like the center of high sartorial fashion is the glamour city of Paris, where almost every minute you are enthralled by the snazzy designs displayed in show windows by the fashion pundits. Yves Saint Laurent, Pierre Cardin, Gucci, and other greats of innovative dressing. While all the world looks to this city for new ideas in haute couture, there is one man in India who visualizes the entire design scenario in a starkly contrasting manner and medium though it is through high fashion and high tech that Hafiz Contractor seeks inspiration for his buildings. Each one a brilliant innovation in itself. Well, of course, this type of writing is editorializing. It's telling you how to think about the work. So you have to edit these things. It's popularizing architecture at the same time as it can be, can be, trivializing it? That is an important question. But it's not trivializing it for me, it's trivializing it for every one of you in different ways. For contractor believes that architecture can be as personal as the clothes we wear. Do you believe that? When you read it in the newspaper, test it, question it. But this is going out, this is popularizing architecture. This is a um, I think it was the Sunday Times in India, uh, Times of India Supplement, 1987. This architect is a man who thinks differently in sensational and yet logical terms that often leaves the common man confused, yet spellbound. We can talk about that, um, and this is what I want to kind of stay with, because are we confused, bewildered, do we not know how to read today? I think we'd still do. And we need to take care. Then you might go to someone like the philosopher who proposes, who is non-architect, who popularizes architecture in a different way. So I repeat, the public's understanding of architecture, is it the public's understanding of architect's architecture, the public's perception of architecture? This is merely to start the conversation. And the most important thing is this. L'architecture d'une femme. The architecture of women. Because mostly it's absent. From the 20th century, most of the critical histories written by men, for men, for architects, do not have a very wide perspective, gender or female architects. So it's, it's a thing that has to be addressed, it is being addressed, but it also becomes part of how we need to spread architecture. Okay, that's my introduction to try and get a conversation going. So I think um, uh, Vibhuti and Sanjoy, please, um, you need a microphone Sanjoy, I think.
thank you. Thank you. Just one more chair. One you can sit. Okay. These are the young and architecture. There we go. Send Joy. You want to go there? You, you have a microphone? Uh, microphone for. Thank you. <coughs> so come there. Sorry if I took a little bit. Joy, would you, um, Roger's already raised um, two or three questions. Should we uh, first, would you like to respond to any of these and, and I'll see where it goes. You know, Sir Roger, Lord Roger, um, I remember about seven or eight years ago listening to Tom Pritzker uh, talk about architecture and the architectural prize that yes. the Pritzkers yep. instituted in Chicago. Uh, for the world. And it was the first time that I said, we must have something that is a platform uh, that makes architecture and design accessible. Yesterday, um, in, at FICI, which is the industry body, it's one of the two industry bodies here, uh, I was giving the opening thing at, at our art and culture uh, convention, Smart Cities, Art Cities. And again, I said that the future really belongs to uh, when India's diversity in craft marries design and architecture and meets with technology and is able to put it out. The fact that there are so many students of architecture today here, I was telling the dean uh, and your vice chancellor at lunch that this is India's future. It sits here. Unfortunately, when I walked into the building, I didn't get a sense that I was in India. I, didn't, I don't get a sense that any of what I see around us, uh, this chair, the table, you know, the wood around, is reflective of what India has to offer. Perhaps the brick wall outside is the closest that you'll get, and the quota stone. What I think is imperative going forward or doing some crystal uh, gazing is that until unless young people also understand the width and breadth of diversity in the forms that we have around us um, at the basic levels of in the village, in the craft tradition, in everything from how water can be traditionally retrieved, etc we're not going to be necessarily able to address what is the need of the hour, not just the glass towers that you see spread across uh, Gurgaon, which should have heat-saving uh, architecture rather than heat-losing architecture, but it should also give you a sense of where you are. And that is one of the biggest challenges that cities or urban settlements and villages will have looking into the future. And much what I, w what I was telling the Vice Chancellor, I hope that apart from the traditionalist sense of architecture uh, and design, what you're also looking at is innovation. Because there is, as you said, architecture of women, a little uh, architecture, there is architecture in everything. We, and there is design in everything. It's the coming together of that that we need to look at specific. Yes. Um, so um, I think you raised um, uh, an important point that uh, uh, by commenting on the building that nothing in the building is looks Indian also indicates uh, the, the gulf in the kind of vocabulary we use to design to, uh, and uh, as you know that um, Indian architecture was institutionalized uh, in 1913 as uh, in JJ School of art as a, as, as, as a department of architecture and it was uh, introduced to train draftsmen so that the British could uh, build their buildings. And, and of course, uh, 
uh, this has been um, my personal struggle as well in trying to get craftsmen to teach the students directly, but because they're not architects, they don't have a license, they can't be employed as faculty. So what I'm saying is there's, there's this huge gulf in, try in communication with uh, the rest of India, so to speak. Uh, how, I what is, w w is there a common vocabulary one can, one can uh, work towards? Or h how do you think this gulf can be bridged? Because I, I think it's exactly what Professor said. How do you communicate? Finally, everything is about communication. It's the look and the feel. If you get your communication right, what is stopping you know, hundreds and thousands and millions of people having an understanding of what they're looking for or what they should be looking for? And that in itself, the minute an informed audience starts asking the right question, I mean, his presentation today was really ask the question, read the book, ask the question. If you're not asking the right question, I'll give you an example. I remember at some point about 20 years ago when uh, my wife and my father decided that we needed to build a house somewhere and they found a plot of land. And everybody forgot that we had given you know, an architect something to do. And two years later, I sort of casually asked, uh, by the way, what's happened? And they said, oh, let's go and see it. So we went and saw it with the architect. And I looked at the balcony and I said, um, isn't that crooked? So the guy closes one eye and starts looking like that and says, no, it's okay. So I asked the, the builder, I said, what's he doing? He said, oh, he's blind. He can't see, actually. So I said, he can't see. You know, and you don't ask the question. So because for two years we didn't ask, where's the kitchen? What's it going to be? What's the material? Is it going to be a stone that's you know, from India? What's the inlay? What's the we didn't get necessarily what we wanted. We made it what we wanted. But you have to ask the question. If you don't know, uh, as he said, if you have no understanding of knowledge, how will you ask the question? Richard Dawkins, for those of you who don't, I was really hurt to know that you didn't know Richard Dawkins. We had Richard jo Dawkins come to the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, last year, so obviously we failed in communicating the fact that somebody like that had actually come down. So what, um, what part of your, let's talk about your Jaipur Literature Festival, what part of your festival talks about architecture? If, if any. Uh, so, um, so we need to separate that and I'll answer it somewhat differently. When we started the festival, has anybody been to the festival? Any? One, two. But no students have been. Very sad. We need to do outreach. Yeah. So one. Okay. So when we started the festival, for those of you who know, we started it in the Darbar Hall, which is in the, in the actual Haveli of the thing. And it was 270 people, a hall slightly larger than this perhaps and uh, had four bathrooms and roughly that's what it was. A cold winter morning 12 years ago, I was wondering whether we should remove 100 chairs from uh, the main space so that we could accommodate. I mean, it would look full even if only 170 came. Uh, today, 12 years later, that particular space has grown and there are now 116 toilets as an example. The entire architectural space has changed from being a hostelry which used to be given out at 700 rupees a night, a bed. Today they charge 15,000 a night for a room. They have over, I think, 140 rooms there. And the whole architecture of the area has completely changed and evolved because of our needs and demands. So today we've grown from a 270 uh, per session, so say about a couple of thousand uh, over the first three days, to accommodating over 500,000 people um, over five days at the festival. To be able to do that, the architecture of the festival, not just the physical architecture of being able to contain so many people per hour, and the way the traffic flows or the architecture of way, the way we make sure places are accessible and you go from one place to the other, the way that the venues are laid out, everything is changed and everything is about architecture and design. Our, our canopies, as you all know, reflect the, the design of the space. The way it's built is to ensure safety and security, is to ensure one year we had rain that brought everything down and yet we had to start at 9.30. Maybe, maybe, maybe I could, I've got that. Maybe I could ask, I, I think this is really interesting. 
And um, I want to go to the Hay Literature Festival, and I want to compare with Glastonbury, the biggest rock festival in Britain. Uh, you mentioned the architecture of the event, which is extremely important. What happens, how do you manage to, I mean, five-day event, so you put a huge infrastructure for the five-day. How, how do you store? How do you, wha what do you do with all this? How do you work it? So, so everything is then broken down, and we have a big storage warehouse now in Jaipur, because much of what we've put there is commissioned by us. So it's not necessarily rented from that. existing. But do you bring anything to the city outside the five days? We do. do leave we there? do not. We we leave everything in the warehouses. But but we don't do anything outside of that. I Unlike here, that. which yeah. That. But w w so what I'm thinking is that uh, there's two things here uh, in relation to architecture. One, the Jaipur Festival could have a role in um, a civic, urban sensitivity to some of these things that are there in the five days, but al also could contribute to the city in... So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So when the festival started, because our whole idea was to make it a festival for the city, and when we inherited a, a version of the festival, which was the Jaipur Virasat Heritage Program, it was seen to be a very elitist, very white festival. Uh, this festival emerged when we when that festival was about to die and the founder said, you know, this is your baby, how can you let it die? So we went in and we took this out. We wanted everybody in the city to want to come to the festival. It resulted in three years down the road, um, the first time we put security into place and I was standing at the, at the roundabout where I greet people for an hour every day and uh, this man and a boy walked through the gate and it looked like they didn't belong, they were wearing you know, traditional clothes, etc. So they were stopped. And because I was there, I went up and I said, can I help you? And he said, you know, I sleep on the pavement uh, opposite SMS hospital up the street. And I know I'll never be able to buy a book for my son, nor be able to send him to my school, to, to a school. But I thought if he heard a story, it would change his life forever. Now look at what happened. The scooter drivers, I mean, the three-wheeler scooter drivers used to park outside. They came to us and said, what can we do f for the festival? So we said, why don't we get a bunch of artists to be able to paint these scooters and create something that becomes a visual narrative. The city came to us and said, we want to give you money because it's become embarrassing for us that everybody talks about the Jaipur Literature Festival, but you don't, but you don't take any money from us. And the then minister, Bina Kak, went to my wife, who has nothing to do with the festival, and said, meaning he's cutting our nose off you have to tell him to take the money. So I said, we don't want the money. Why don't you instead look at how you can improve the look and feel of the city? So what did they do? They created a commission and we gave them some basic ideas. We said, listen, so many thousands of people come to the stations, you know, young people. So they said, why don't we paint them traditionally? Why, or why don't you paint them traditionally? Why don't you redo the old city of, of Ahmed? Not because it's Republic Day or Independence Day or the festival light it so that it's lit you know 12 months in the yeah. year because this is a tourist destination and our whole idea of the festival borrowed from edinburgh in many ways which is where we set up our first platform was to look at how built heritage and arts and culture could come together and the arts and culture provided um, uh, an opportunity and an economic opportunity for those people who had built heritage so that they didn't pull it down and built the new malls and the new... So, uh, no, I, I appreciate that. So, do you see in the future that there are different models around the world for this sort of uh, cultural event that becomes an agent for change, which you're talking about in a way? No, and and uh, often it starts with art. It's a natural. It, it did in Liverpool. But within Liverpool, the festivals started to become agents of civic change uh, wider or longer than their presence in the city. So I suppose what I'm asking you, can you see yourself um, as doing that for Jaipur or because you're doing other things, teamwork wouldn't, wouldn't actually, because you would be, when you said that, well, we gave them some ideas, you'd be well placed to have um, an, 
whatever it is, a, an agency, or it, and it's not necessarily pro bono, but where you would um, encourage a sort of, it would start something. If you see. We basically see ourselves as incubators and people who give ideas, create a platform and then allow local communities to take that and run with that if they wish to. Okay. And if you look at Jaipur's economy today, this is the largest single event in the country uh, at this point of time in terms of its contribution to local GDP, much as the Edinburgh Festival, which contributes, uh, last year it contributed 1.3 billion pounds of additional spend into Edinburgh's economy uh, over a four week period. Jaipur, the festival, about five years ago when we last did the survey, contributed about 60 crores of additional spend uh, into the city in that period of time. What we do do is we have uh, loads of people who come to us and say exactly what you did, uh, including the government. Will you do this? And we say, no, we're not well placed to do it for you. Okay. Let's look at the communities here who can do this for you better because they know the know-how. They need to be empowered. So what do we do? Every year we do a huge student program. So we reach out through our writers, we reach out to 120 odd schools where the schools can't come to us because you know they're economically backward or they. We then also do, we do a call for a submission. So by September, we, from across the world, people apply to us to volunteer in the festival. Uh, and we close the thing at about 2000 in September. We then, all of these people are interviewed, selected, and I think we select about 400. And then they go through a whole training program for a period of a month or so leading up to the festival, which is the reason why the volunteers at the festival are seen to be incredible. Everybody talks about them. But what does it do to the city? It gives them the skill set to be able to do 20 other things that we wouldn't be able to do. You know, so we are able to build capacity. And we work with all the universities, not just there. We work with universities in <coughs> in the UK, in Australia, and America, and now give them all a quota. You can give 15 kids, you can give 10 kids. But the idea is to build capacity. And I'll give you another example. So in Egypt, which is one, I mean, we do a lot of our festivals in places where there is, there is a need because of civil or civic unrest. So in Egypt, uh, just post the Arab Spring, where Egypt was seen to be very dangerous, um, uh, uh, the then government reached out to our ambassador uh, saying, we'll, we'll Will he please ask us to come and give them a strategy? Because it's something we've done in Johannesburg, in Newtown, uh, in the early two, uh, in the early 2000s. Something we've done in New York, uh, 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 down in in, in Soho, etc. As to how to turn a, a, an area around, how to turn the community around. And what did we do? We said, okay, the biggest problem here is you've lost 90% of your tourism, which forms 70% of your GDP. People are not coming from the Western Europe, et cetera, because they think it's unsafe. So we set the festival in the airport terminal. And that then became viral, and CNN and BBC, everybody carried it, as a result of which when the Boston bombing happened in, in Boston, Logan Airport got through to us and said, will you come and do the same thing there? So what we try and do is we do stuff that then connects with the people, yeah popularizes it and tries to address a particular aspect. Yeah, yeah. What we can't do is change the world. I, no, it's I understand a, that. Let's go on so to our yeah, So um, I would also like to use this platform to, in a way, brainstorm on the idea of uh, using uh, both of your expertise to, um, to address this uh, question of public understanding of architecture. So um, if you were to have a festival of towards that festival of public understanding of architecture, what would it be like? How would you do it? It needs to be in a fantastic place, you know, a humpy or, or some place that evokes a feeling. Finally, location, location, location is one of the five pillars that you have to look at to be able to do something that's, that will grow and find its own trajectory. Location is absolutely imperative. But uh, okay, no, I, I sometimes the festival, the, you know, um, Edinburgh, not Edinburgh, but there, sometimes Edinburgh the is all about location. There are festivals that have popularized. It is all about lo location. You know, Glastonbury is about a field. Classical music festivals that happen in some remote village but in the UK. Let me just turns around can I break in here? I think 
Uh, I'd like to. I was only beginning to talk. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. We've only got five minutes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, sure. No, uh, I just wanted to pick up on what you said because, yes, location, location, location. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a market corporate. It's a market, market corporate. But I think if we were talking about popularizing or the public understanding of architecture in Jai Jaipur, would you take it on within? I think it, it's better that architects are pro or talk or promote it within a literary festival, not make it a standalone, because again, we're putting it outside. To me, it would make much more sense to have a... Yeah, um, so that, that was going to be my next question, uh, which I asked uh, early on. How much of the festival actually represents architecture? How much architecture is talked not about much. in... Uh, in I mean, if you talk why? about architecture at its broadest span, uh, so the architecture of design or the architecture of AI, etc., of course, that's in every session. If you're talking about a specific session on architecture, Possibly when a Gautam Bhatia has come or one of the authors who you talked about who have come, yes. But just going back for a second here, of course you can do it in an already existing festival. I don't know whether you guys know there's about 23 design or architecture festivals in India. Everything from Curious, which addresses a aspect of design to what you have er, that's happening right now in, in, in Delhi. We as an organization, because I've been very, very bullish on design and architecture, wanted to acquire an existing architecture and design festival. We wanted to, because I was very keen that this is our next whatever, which is everything that I plan to do. One of the ideas that came to us, for example, is that if you look at MG Road, so everything from Gitorni to uh, Kutub, there's 57 mapped um, uh, places of architecture and design that exist. So the one thought that was brought to us is why don't we use this and make it a traveling thing and I said no, the traffic will defeat it because you can't travel from one to the other and these kinds of people may not be willing to only take the metro, for example. Um, because of the nature of architecture, not necessarily its specialization or you know the academic interest but that too you need to create a sexy product. Why is it today that of our 500,000 people, 80% of our audience is below the age of 30? Unheard of across the world in any literary combined because people feel it's a sexy place to go to. You can go to, go to the festival for Domino's or whatever the pizza is, or food or a selfie, and you can go to hear the best academics from MIT and Harvard and wherever else, and popular fiction writers. For architecture and design, because you're in a particular space and you need to build awareness, you have to create something. So that is what per perplexes me, that you have the location, but architecture is completely missing from either the discussions, the books, the, you know, even uh, students of archi but, architecture. But, but why is it perplexing? When have architects or school, this oh. is the first time I've ever visited your institute. The first time I've ever come to this part of Gurgaon. Forget the rest, why is it perplexing? Have you all reached out? Do architecture schools or, or books or professors reach out beyond their community? Because architecture finally equals wealth and money. You know where your wealth and money is situated and located very specifically. Sure. And you don't need, like he said, I'm not you going actually to don't need yes. that larger audience. So I'm not going to defend uh, that because I. No, no, you I need I it. I'm, I'm, I, I didn't say. And architecture it. have been very elitist and, and, and to some extent. But it doesn't need to. I mean, Laurie no, Baker. It, that's what we're trying to change. That's what we're trying to change. And we, if we did, did reach out to you, you would welcome us. I know that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Roger, I want to put the same question to you. Uh, if you were to curate a festival of architecture at the JLF, um, what, w what would you do? Um, at, at, uh, what I would do is um, look into some of the uh, marquees and the tents or the festival structures that are traditional to the Jaipur, to the courts, um, and I'd probably propose a specific marquee 
uh, much, and then I would invite thematically um, writers on architecture uh, who have done a range of books to also debate with writers of other other things. So, and then have a si which which I think you do. But th uh, those of you who don't know Hey on Why, Hey on Why has a terrific um, interactive. You probably do do, do this interactive environment. So I would make it a completely, not necessarily a one-off, it might work into an a annual, uh, the, you know, the architecture tent, which would be designed specially for each year, and it would respect and um, resonate with the culture you're talking about, uh, the idea of architecture in the city, and also back to the tradition you have of, of these um, uh, structures that can be put up very quickly. That's I, I, I would take that even one step further and, I, I, and you know this is these are associations that we have with everything from energy saving to green that you identify a group of uh, students and faculty who work with the space and with our colleagues to be able to create something that becomes a showcase for the university for what you've done representing today contemporary India using some traditional designs which we do creating contemporary spaces looking at the efficiency of that space looking at how from the minute you put it up to the minute you take it down what does it entail because we for example this year because of the past uh, years where there's been rain and because we are always very conscious about safety we created a whole new system working with an energy and a cabling partner to ensure that every cable was run in a way that was safe and nobody would come in contact with them. Of course it cost more than the earlier budget, but it was worth the investment. So similarly, not just about, when we talk about architecture, not just the design right. of the larger bits, what should be the glass? That, 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 we, that we use. We, we want to get rid of plastic bottles. How do we separate the waste? How, what's the movement of people? How do plates move? Everything that we do today at the festival uh, to make it more efficient is to use technology. Yes, that, that, that's more uh, infrastructural uh, contribution. I, I was referring more to sort of a, you know, uh, an exhibition on books on architecture because I think there is a hunger among students, among you know, citizens of this country to read about architecture, and that's that's how the understanding will develop, or or the taste will develop for knowing more about architecture. So, um, a curated exhibition of books on architecture. Till you till you have till you have somebody like him, or or, or, or people who are who are articulate and can be uh, both entertaining and and educative. Um, that book is not going to be bought except by people who have access anyway. The, the people who buy books, so we had Dr. Sharad Paul from New Zealand, for example, talking about genetics, and we had uh, 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 the Nobel laureate um, uh, talking about physics, and we had Priyam Vadhan talking about black hole. The reason they sold as much as Jeffrey Archer did was because their session was brilliant. And it didn't matter, and everybody wanted to go and buy the book. So it's really about how you can articulate. Or when Sandal came to do a session in, in Jaipur, I mean, you know, who had heard of him as a philosopher in India? Or Marcus de Sotoy in mathematics? Their books flew off the shelf because of how articulate they were and how popular they had made something like mathematics for a general group who sort of shies away from it. And the other area that we need to work in is to remove this divide between the arts and the sciences and get people to understand that for one, the other is necessary and it doesn't have to be this big issue. You have to work on it together. Today in architecture, you have to talk about the science in it, of the material, of the way it's processed, of the way that you all use it in different ways. And we don't do that. I, I'm sure you do it in your university, but in the lay in the lay world, we don't have access to that. You know, and we ha these are platforms of influence. 
I mean, for us to curate a session, that's the easy one, which is the reason I've sort of stayed away by saying, of course, we'll curate a session. Sure, send us, an send us a slew of interesting writers and speakers. You know, that's the that easy be, aspect, that but that's beginning. not enough. That's not enough. No, certainly not enough. And, and I was, we were talking about what it might do for, for visitors of JLF is to build their interest in reading about architecture and also talking about the environment and, and one of the things that one of the things that produces the gulf between uh, say uh, the users and, and the designers is that um, we talk about it in different language so as Roger said you know we, do, we, we talk about it in terms of masses volume aesthetic experience which which and the shared common language uh, has uh, has died 200 years ago. I mean, we have stopped using that shared common language. And how do you, how do you get that vocabulary back into architecture is also a struggle. You know, what a dehelij is, is yeah. a dehelij. It's not a threshold. You know, the dehelij is a philosophical How do you bring concept. the love for arch or good architecture? I, I, have any of you been to Chicago? Anybody been to Chicago? Please go there to see, this, to see the skyline uh, of the city, which is very accessible because they build this whole park in front of it. It is one of the most beautiful skylines, and it boasts of some of the most stunning, um, what are they called? Uh, uh, what's the multi-story called? Hi high, rise. uh, high rises. Stunning. That's where you will get your love for stuff like that. If you want to look at traditional architecture, go to some of the stunning uh, uh, temples down south, which creates and sets into place everything. You're talking about veranda, about launching, which I think is a fabulous name, by the way. Go to places which have got fabulous verandas. Get that love of architecture. Start from there. Okay, I was talking about the, uh, the difference in vocabulary in terms of, you know, for example, we say I had an egg for breakfast. Or if I say I had under. Now, under is a completely different philosophical construct that you had for breakfast. It isn't an egg. You see what I mean? So when you talk to laymen about the building uh, environment and the, the, the jharoka, the dehlij, the uh, imarat, you know, the language is different. And how, so what, we were, what we, we were talking about is how to get that vocabulary back in as, as a way of increasing the public understanding. Is there, can there be a shared vocabulary? Of, co of course it can be. Of course they can be. It's just a question of how do you make both this, the, the vocabulary that you're talking about, like anda or chhatri or jharoka or whatever, accessible and understandable to the larger construct. The simple thing in literature that we would do is get a good translator. I'll give you an example. So you all know Gulzar Saab? Have you ever you've heard or seen a song called Chaya Chaya and Jai Ho? Yes, everybody? If you go on YouTube and you look at the translation of Chaya Chaya, it's laughable. So Nasreen Munni Kabir with Gulzar has come out with this definitive thing of what his poetry actually translates to. Why? Because Gulzar is an extremely inarticulate person. He's a great poet, but he doesn't know how to communicate. And a Chanya Chanya song, who knows the meaning of Chanya? Anybody here? But you've all seen the song, right? All seen it, but nobody knows the word. So Chanya in Gulzar's uh, iconography means uh, 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 Chaya, shade. So Chanya Chanya is under the shade, under the shade. So just to having demonstrated that, you have to make sure that it's understandable. And you can only do that when people like him are able to articulate and ensure that that lost in translation doesn't happen, which happens a lot of the time in architecture. I, 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 agree, I agree with you. I want, to, I want to just move you to, or move us to a little thing that, yes, to sell a book generally, Jeffrey Archer can sell a book because he can, he can talk for England. I mean, no problem. He was the fifth. Uh, he was fifth on the best-selling list of the festival, not first. No, no, but but still, he can he can he can sell. But what what I think I'm what I would like to ask you is that 
it's not just to bring in an architectural writer, let's say, who can talk and who writes well. <coughs> it's does the festival have a position for being part of a public discourse? And what I mean by a public discourse is if, for example, uh, you had events, which you probably do, but say you invited William Gibson, who is you know, one of the, the eminent science fiction writers um, today in his 50s after doing Neuromancer. If you invited someone like Terry Gilliam, who is the filmmaker, uh, and if you invited someone who is writing, and they talked about their work, that is naturally a discourse and the people in your in the Jaipur would be being introduced to a new discourse. So my question is whether you think a literary festival could take that role and actually expand beyond the. Of course, you have a mar uh, investment and you have to make you know um, the money you, you you set out. But do you see yourself as a, a role in this in this form of public discourse? So uh, anybody heard of Thomas Piketty? Anybody read Thomas Piketty's work? Anybody knows Thomas Piketty? You guys need to be doing way more reading than just architecture. So uh, Thomas Piketty looked at figures uh, and looked at some of India's data and crunched the data and told the story about India's economy. And uh, 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 he went on to becoming a very eminent, he's very young, but you know, very eminent. So to answer your question, somebody like Thomas Piketty, typically we would put him into a session with a philosopher, a mathematician, whatever, to be able to tell the story that he's been, he's, he, he has told, but also being able to make it understandable and Outside. accessible. Right. Well, so we it's not that. just, I mean, of course, when there's an Oprah Winfrey or a, a Jeffrey Archer, they would also do individual presentation sessions, if at all, very rarely. But we would ne necessarily have it as a, a panel or a discussion to make it much more accessible and therefore interesting. It's like um, uh, uh, the, the, the chairman of, of, of uh, DBS Bank in Singapore uh, said to me a couple of years ago, he said, the reason why I come here every year is that I go away with a million ideas. It refreshes and revives me because you stumble into, I mean, most people of the 500 speakers that we had this time, maximum I would challenge people to know more than 30 of the speakers who were there in terms of name recognition. The others, you stumble upon and hear them in a panel or whatever, and you're blown away by the sheer brilliance of what they, what they have to present. And in, and in many ways, whether it's a Hay or, or whatever, or an Edinburgh Festival or Cheltenham, etc., what makes these places interesting is that you're able to also look into the future while making sense of the present in the context of what's happened in the past. That is the important thing. And similarly, even in any architectural design uh, festival or program, you need to do that. You can't say that this is the future of architecture on the moon without having figured how that will happen or the progression thereof. So do you, are you changing, for example, are you working with next year's already? How do, how do you work? As so we team? work in an 18-month cycle. So we've published our list for 2020 at the back of our brochure in 2019. Okay. So we're now programming for 2021. But we also continue to program for 2020 as the themes. It works in a... Uh, ours is not a didactic festival, meaning there's no one director and therefore whatever. Uh, William Dalrymple does the international... Uh, list, Namita does uh, the India and the East list. I look at the politics, economics, you know, business, blah, blah, blah. Have, have you ever had uh, an architect who has written a book at Jaipur? I'm sure we have. If you ask me the name, absolutely, I wouldn't remember. But people like Gautam Bharti, etc. had. And um, one of the books that you had presented. Talk, talk of the town, the Indian essays. No, no. Jerry, of course, Jerry Pinto, all of these people have come, but have we done a, a specific session on architecture? I'm not sure. No. Have we launched a book on architecture? I think we have, but I don't think we've done a session specifically. Have you, la have you launched books on um, architect practices? Do they come and talk, as far as you know? No. No, you've never been approached by 
It's not just approach. I mean, if I wasn't here, this wouldn't even be part of my sensibility of, I mean, having seen what you've shown me, uh, it's opened my eyes. But in New York, for example, we had a, a forensic uh, 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 architecture, ex I can't remember, we did a big session in MoMA, which was one of our first GLFs in New York, where we had an architect. We had, uh, what's her name, the lady who died two years ago? Uh, we had her, and uh, we had Tom, and we had some, which we were looking at the architecture of, um, uh, what was the, it was the forensics of architecture is what the key issue it's, was. It's, it's quite interesting because the neuroscientists, and I, 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 I suspect you've had neuroscientists, the neuroscientists are, are using a vocabulary that's within the architecture discourse at the moment. and. Uh, again, that's the public discourse that could bring to um, you know, a challenging audience in India neuroscience crossed with architecture, crossed with design. Um, and of course, these are ideas that we could, we could brain, brainstorm, but I suppose the, que the question comes is how open that can be and how you It can that. be. I mean, we're pretty open. We're yeah. happy to receive. I'll give you another example. So in Houston, and every, anybody heard of Houston, the United States? Anybody knows what Houston is known for? It's sort of the oil and gas capital and the medical capital of the United States. So all we did there was we brought these people together from Lionel Basil and Exxon and so on and so forth with all of the medical guys and we said, listen guys, what is it that you do and what is it that you do? You build, you create technology which is based on pumps and pipes for oil and gas. What do the medical people do? They do technology based on pumps and pipes because that's your human body. I said, do it together. And we've done a whole series of now programs around pumps and pipes, looking at both medicine. So Sandeep Johar's new book on the heart, that's the, on the time bestseller list, for example. He was one of the first people. Ticker was the other person. And it has created an incredible thing just in Houston. Because while they, they inhabited the same space, none of them looked at the commonality of practice, whereas that's what it is. I want to ask you both a question uh, uh, regarding uh, the 80s. Um, the 80s and a bit of early 90s was a time when people were still very disturbed about bad design. So if a bad building came up in parties, we would trash it. We would say, you know, what on earth was he thinking? What are, what are we getting? We were troubled by it. We would talk about there was a lot of activism in the studio. We would want to change the world. What happened? Why don't we, why doesn't bad design disturb us anymore? Why are we getting I, so numb? I think Gautam Bhatia's book, whoever's written, read Punjabi Baroque, sort of answers. In the 80s, in the, it's an 80s Answers book. most of that because we are so used to ugliness. Aesthetic, that the, the aesthetics, the use of color, the use of material has now escaped us. We're so focused on the future and what's out there that we've forgotten to look at what's here and what should be part of our aesthetic uh, space. And primarily, that also comes from migration because you're seeing more and more migrant families being uprooted from their traditional spaces, their traditional comfort zones, being completely taken to a different place like a Gurgaon, which has no representation of anything of what they hold dear you forget, and you forget that you then start building and creating ugliness. And I'm sorry that I'm commenting on this, your wonderful university, but that's what I see. I don't see, uh, except for the, the red brick thing outside, I don't see an aesthetic feature in this room. You haven't visited I'm many sorry. architecture schools. I, I know. <laughs> I mean, this chair that I'm sitting on has to be the most monstrous thing ever designed. And it's part of an architectural university, college, thingamajig. We can barely sort of move in it. I mean, come on. Roger loves these I, I I'm sorry. I, have I, have, um, I think the, the, the notion of, the sn <laughs> the notion of kitsch, of kitsch should, be, <laughs> should be part of our vocabulary um, in, in this. But <coughs> do you want question, to do, a, yeah, your closing, question, yeah. um, possibly different from India, and it might interest all the students, um, 1970s, 1980s was um, the result of a huge period of, of ideas in the 70s. We, 
which, which came out of all sorts of things, pop art, and you can look at it in progressive music, you can look at it, look at David Bowie's, David Bowie's life will tell you. Okay, but what happened, then we had the oil crisis, I'm talking about a, a critical history, because these things have critical histories, we need to, we need to know these. Um, the oil crisis in 76, 73 to 76, this is, this is Europe. And, and it's significant, we're not talking about China or Africa or Latin America because we don't know that. We don't know that at that time. But what happened is that architecture suddenly hit a slump. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and there was a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of optimism in the 80s where we were doing things across discipline um, and there was a lot of talk, there was a big explosion of, of art and things and then the geopolitical climate changed and we got, architects suffered big time from this. In the early 90s, I was, I know I had friends in, in, in uh, Finland, they were encouraged, any architect who had to enter a tender for a building was encouraged to make it as low as possible to get work. So the 1990s became a period of um, Real frugality, which is why you get the work of Zaha Hadid, Daniel Lieberskind, Rem Koolhaas as paper architecture in the early 90s. They hadn't done their buildings. They did fantastic drawings. Why? Because they were at school in 1979 to 82 in the Architectural Association School in London with Peter Cook, with Cedric Price, with these people who had done fantastic things. Um, so Vibhuti is right that we don't, we have lost a critical inquiry uh, and it's not just in India, this is the same in North America. There's a dearth of critical writing because it's the vocabulary issue, we don't know how to critique, we don't know how to critique Hafiz Contractor today and we should be able to, we don't know how to critique the glass wall today. So this is all part, not only of popularizing architecture, but as Sanjoy has said, of knowing the questions. And we, I'm afraid, we are responsible for it. It's us and we have to start it here. So if we can make a small start in a festival like Jaipur, then I think we should take that challenge on. Because I think it's your responsibility to, resp to respond to this. The fact that Sanjoy said, oh, you should read more, we all know the problem of reading. And you are not alone. In my university, almost reading has come to a standstill. <laughs> I don't, have don't, don't tell them that. It's just about the gun. It, 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 you have to read, yeah. but we have to find new ways, which is why a literary festival has its other role. I really believe it has its other role, too. Can I just, sorry, just add to what he's... The, one of the other issues, and I'm sure it, it reflects in architecture, but I, I, I will not be able to articulate it. One of the things is standardization. Everything is about standardization. And this came home to me the other day when somebody came from China and said to me, Sanjoy, I've just come back from Beijing or Shanghai, and everybody, man or woman, wore black. And here I've come into Jaipur, which is this incredible feast to the eye because it's all about color and it's not about standardization and it's not about black. S you know, similarly, if you looked at Hey on Why, for example, that's what you'd see. Today, Hey on Why has introduced color and the flags and the buntings because everybody who went back, including them from Jaipur, looked at the celebration of color and realized that that was a contribution to the visual aesthetics that when you walk into a space. So the minute you get into standardization, so NDMC or whatever, M you know, the designs are also standardized. So to get permission, I'm assuming, this building to build whatever the F F FSI or FCI, whatever it is, you had to create a standardized design. What did that do to you? It didn't allow you to innovate. And unlike in theater and the arts, where frugality is very much part and parcel of your being, and therefore you innovate because you don't have resources and you want to create stuff, architecture and anything that was at that scale, they went into this frozen zone where they didn't know what to do because they'd lost the resources to be able to do it. Nobody then actually innovated to how then can we look at new material? 
how then can we look at a new design in many ways like Lori Baker did, for example. You know, what will work for this space? In, now, you can't transport Lori Baker's design necessarily into a cold climb. You can't because it's in a particular kind of context. So one has to look at that as well when you're looking at But guys, I, even when I was young, I spent most of my time sitting in jail because I was protesting about something, not necessarily in class because I was bored like all of you are today. But it was only much later when I went into places like Oxford or Cambridge to give lectures and I'm invited only because I have long hair, not that I know anything. It's only then that I realized, oh my God, just the sheer pleasure of knowledge is unbelievable. This is your time. The rest of the time that you're going to have, you're going to be slogging away for somebody else doing the most pedantic and mundane jobs initially. This is the time that you can read. Don't lose it. Reading is as wonderful as watching Netflix, let me tell you. Go for it. I hope your library is, is a great library. Thank you. Um, can I briefly uh, throw it open to the students for any questions? 325. Five minutes, two questions. If they have. In the corner. Wearing green. Are you, are you rushing off? So um, you just, this, my question is directed towards Sanjay. Uh, sir, you talked, by the end of your, the talk, you talked about how um, reading should be inculcated and we all should read and everything. My question to you is, uh, this conference is, involves people only part of the architectural, like people in the architectural field. What is it that we can do other than reading? Because what I see around me today, not a lot of people like reading. I mean, they're not very... So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, this uh, Last year, the youngest writer at JLF whose book we released was 13 years old, who had been coming uh, with her parents, Vidhu Vinod Chopra and Anupama Chopra's daughter. And she was inspired and she wrote her first book when she was 12, which we released at 13. This year, the youngest writer who we released and the oldest, the youngest was 10, the oldest was 92. But I had gone to a, you know, a, a university award ceremony. They wanted to get me to give out this year's whatever. And at the end, they hijacked me or they ambushed me. And this young kid, seven year old, comes up to stage who had been coming to the festival from when he was three. And they wanted me to release this book. And I was like rolling my eyes and saying, you know, anyway. I looked at the book. It was unbelievable. And I said, there's no way a seven year old could have written this. The mother then showed me his diary that he had written the story and, and etched in. Oh my God, it's enough to blow you away. So when you're saying popularizing a reading, in the same way that Netflix popularizes some of the best fiction and non-fiction, whether you've seen, I don't know whether you guys have seen this uh, documentary somebody was telling me about the Vietnam War, which is on Netflix, which is supposed to be amazing. This is all about knowledge and information. What does a book do? It transports you and allows you your imagination of being able to decide what you would like it to be as opposed to a Netflix that tells you this is it. So it's a, and for as architecture students, if you all don't read to be inspired, uh, you shouldn't be in this, in this university. Please leave, go and do retail or whatever else you want to do. If you're not reading, don't be, in, don't, be in, don't be in a university. Don't waste your time. You're wasting their time, your parents' money. I'm sure you all have many other interesting, amazing things to do. Go and do it. But if you're doing this and if you love doing it, man, read 24-7. I read six books at a time. I don't have the time, but I do it. Because I love it. It's not because somebody is forcing me to do it. You have to. It's part of your... You know, I mean, you're, you might as well be dead if you're not reading, guys. Come on. You're in university. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry I'd go in on tirade and everybody keeps telling me, no, you we, know, don't we speak. We actually have a very strong uh, critical thinking track called Therian Method, and we make them read from first to first semester. And by the time they're in fourth, which year are you in? First year, yeah. You'll feel the pain for a year. 
and then <laughs> by the time you come to the festival not just our festival go to any festival a music festival a theater festival a literature festival a da- go go see and you said you know architecture student you should this should be open to all students no, of they, your university they do read they We're soon, we're soon going to invent an injection and it's going to go intravenous. And no, then you'll get all the information directly to the brain. No, but on a more serious note, seriously, go and see everything. Go and see buildings, go for walks, go for tours, go into, uh, in, in, in New Delhi, another trust that I'm part of, Salam Balak Trust, we do a city walk, go and see how the kids live there. Do all, all of we this as all part of, of your education. Ne- and next question, any, any other question? Yeah. And then um, Aman. So my basic point is that um, when we say populi- popularization, popularization, popularization of architecture, mouse, sorry, when we say popularization of architecture, and we say dialing down or, t- or toning the architectural vocabulary differently, um, isn't it kind of asking a surrealist to paint a realistic picture? So that and actually moving back from the time f- um, to which we have developed. Because if, yeah. if I, if I, if as a fourth year, I, I pick up a book and it's written by a person like Gautam Bhatia, mm. and I, I might not find it, find it as fant- um, as fantasizing as Rem Kulas's Delirious New York or X- SML Excel. Mm. Um, next so that's point. interesting. So um, the vocabulary is very much part of how they design Roger. So uh, do you think if they if um, you change the vocabulary, <coughs> then you're actually not. I think your question is interesting. Um, you already have some people that you are dr- drawn towards, which is natural. Um, when we were talking about popularizing architecture, it's perhaps the wrong phrase. It's not trying to dumb it down. It's not trying to banalize it. It's trying to recognize that other people have a way of seeing architecture that we don't see. So in other words, what I mentioned about a science fiction writer, a science fiction writer is an architect in a way. He's using language as an architect. So what I'm saying is the transfer is there for us to understand. But it's quite reasonable that you can be attracted to Rem Koolhaas Delirious New York and not um, an ironic parody of Greater Kailash. That's good that you're making these, these informed choices. But also, all I'm saying is go wider. Understand the width uh, of the writing, as, as Sanjoy has said. And, re- and read, I mean, how many of you are reading a novel today? You know, a novel. Probably faculty do, but probably, uh, you know, and yesterday we showed a film. And I asked one of my students, and she was sitting through it, and she was there at the end when most of you, or not you, but others had gone. And I said, What's this black and white film to you? She said, I have never seen anything like it. I said, have you ever viewed a film? No. She has never viewed a film in the cinema or on a screen. So these are experiences that we, we've got to bring back. We've got to enjoy. Uh, Aman, Aman. One question, sorry. We have to rush in <laughs> because Sanjoy has to I has have a, a flight. flight. I'm catch. sorry, I'm going. To no Hello, sir. So uh, how the discussion started about where you started pointing out that uh, whatever we see around us doesn't really connect to the context of it. Like this building that we see, it doesn't really connect to its uh, uh, background or its history or anyway, it's to its identity overall. So, uh, and that is one thing that we always try to do in our interventions, in our projects that we do in our uh, syllabus, that we either try to uh, revive the connection, revive the fabrics of it, but we always fail to it. So. Uh, the question is that do we really need to uh, widen our gaze or what are other parameters that we might have to inculcate? Just like how JLF was suppo- uh, able to do it in spreading the awareness on, in, on a larger scale. So do you have, can you also suggest some uh, extensions or some extended parameters that we might have to look at? So, so, so for Picasso to have become Picasso or Rembrandt to have become Rembrandt, they first had to learn to paint in the, as you know, brilliant painters, and then they found their own form, but they did a lot of research. If you see, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, who did the Sistine Chapel? Yeah, Michelangelo. 
so Michelangelo's um, proof of bio data that he sent to the king at that point of time or to the emperor said, I am a mathematician and uh, I mean you could please look at me because I am a mathematician and architect. Uh, uh, a, I, I can read the stars, blah, blah, blah. And at the end it was, and I also paint. And I also paint. So you have to be able to, like you said, get a sense of everything around, then find your voice. Your voice will be different from her voice and his voice and so on and so forth. Yes, we are taught across, but for you to develop your style of a Hafiz contractor to have developed his style, you have to be able to first design as you will and what. You also have to then understand where you're coming from. Laurie Baker, for example, understood that, understood the aesthetics of his space, the history, went back into time, looked at what it was, traditional development, and then found his design. So you're absolutely right. I mean, you've answered, the answer is in your question. Learn as much as you can. See as much. You see a film, or you go to a Bharat Natyam or a dance thing, you will see the architecture of form right there. You will see a frieze come alive. Have any of you been to Khajurao? On one of the friezes, did you see a Gucci bag on one of the temples? Please go, next time when you go back, look at, it's a 1,000 year old temple sporting, uh, you know, what Gucci bag must have copied, etc. 1,000 years ago. So it existed. So when you go to a temple like that, look for stuff that you wouldn't necessarily... I know we tend to glaze over. I mean, no, they, it's were, not, they were probably distracted you know, in Khajuraho. You, yeah. you, you, so <laughs> between, so. between the selfie, the look bag. at what it is. Look at the form. What does that form say to you? Does it speak to you? Does it inspire you? You can go, to a, you can go outside and look at the tree or the, or the fields or the... Uh, mustard seeds outside of a movie by Shah Rukh Khan and admire it for what it is because it has something that it's communicating. Thank you, sir. Any other? Okay. So, the, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Do you want? So, does that mean you are inviting us for JLF? Anytime. Please, any time, guys. Plus, please remember we close, we close registration these days by early December. So you have to register pre, uh, pre December and come. So can we have some uh, free registrations for us? <laughs> it's <free>? all free. <laughs> Sorry, I can't everything is free. We'll, we'll propose something. We'll just propose just something. take it easy. Yeah, we are all too very Take excited to be very part much. of. Uh, Thank you, Mamad. So it's a pleasure. Yes, you go. That's good. That's good.